my name is Jane O'Rourke and welcome to Mind in Mind. Our interviews are featuring some of the pioneers of child psychotherapy who trained with the likes of Melanie Klein, John Bowlby and Anna Freud. These interviews capture thinking that has evolved during decades of working with children and families. At Mind in Mind, we want everyone to have access to this wisdom about what best helps children and their families to thrive, whatever their challenges. Many of us who are drawn to working therapeutically with children have experienced difficulty ourselves growing up. These experiences fuel a desire to give children something perhaps we didn't experience ourselves. Lydia Tischler is one such person who has transformed the early experience of trauma when most of her family were murdered in the Holocaust. She spent most of her teenage years in concentration camps, yet when she came to the UK as a refugee, she was determined to make a difference to children's lives. In this interview, she tells me how she became one of the first child psychotherapists to train with Anna Freud, which began a 70-year career that's been marked by courageous innovation. Lydia went on to transform the treatment of parents and their babies by establishing a family unit at the Castle Hospital in London, saving many seriously at-risk children from being taken into care. Her contribution to the teaching and organisation of child psychotherapy has also been really impressive. She's been a key figure at the British Psychotherapy Foundation and Association of Child Psychotherapy, but she's also changed the lives of thousands of other children internationally. For the last 30 years, as co-founder of the European Federation of Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy, she's established adult and child psychotherapy trainings and services in Central and Eastern Europe. Remarkably, although she's now in her 90s, she's still supervising and teaching. At our website, mindinmind.org.uk, you'll find a transcript of this interview and also other recordings and blogs with leading child psychotherapists such as Monica Laniardo, Iska Wittenberg, Joanna Williams, Juliet Hopkins and Dillis Dawes. I'm sure you'll find listening and learning from Lydia Tischler as rewarding as I have. She's made a deep impression on me for her commitment to children and their families and her capacity to transcend early adversity by helping others. We began our conversation by her telling me about how she began helping other traumatised children in the concentration camps and then, aged only 23, started training as a child psychotherapist with Anna Freud. Thank you very much for talking with me, Lydia. You were one of the first child psychotherapists to start training ever in the world, and I'm, I'm really interested in that. I know that the training had started a few years prior to you beginning at the Anna Freud Centre, or what was then the Hampstead Child Therapy Clinic. It was quite, a, quite an innovating thing to do. I was one of the early ones, yes. yes. The, the pioneers were actually the uh, nurses or the carers who looked after the children when Anna Freud came to England. She set up the war nurseries mm. for uh, babies, uh, for mothers who were working or couldn't look after the children. And all the, all the staff at the, in those war nurseries who were actually also refugees and probably about 18 or 19, they became the first cohort of the training. In fact, I think, I don't know, but I imagine that Anna Freud's idea about training child therapists uh, developed there. When I came to England in '45, I came with the idea that I wanted to work with children. Uh, I didn't have any clear idea about how, but just the idea that this is what I wanted to do. And how this came about, uh, immediately after the war, there was a Czech uh, man called Tremysl Peter, who was actually the equivalent of the, he was a Czech brethren, a uh, religious sect, and he had worked with uh, delinquents before the war. He commandeered a lorry, came to Terezin, and uh, brought out a whole lot of orphans, I mean real orphans, under five children, who had stayed in Terezin while their parents were sent to Auschwitz. 
So to clarify, you have been in Dresdenstadt, the concentration camp. Yes. So um, this was a formative period of your life and really yes. affected your yes. decision to be to train as a child psychotherapist. Uh, not exactly mm. in the camp. And I mean, Terezin wasn't the only camp I was in. I started in Terezin and ended in Terezin after a journey via Auschwitz. Uh, and in that home, I came with these children for some reason, I don't know quite why, I came with these children to this home. And there, where I actually had close contact with these orphans, this is where my uh, idea was formed. And you were aged, what, 16, I 17 at the time? I was aged 16. I was mm. 16 at the mm. time, yes. Mm. By then, I had lost my own mother. You'd lost her. In mother. Auschwitz, yes. Yes. Yeah. So it must have linked somewhere. In what way do you think it linked to your, your working with children? Uh, I came to realize that, you know, we all have different motives why we want to do the work we do. I realize, and working with children also has a, a lot of complicated motives. Often it is that uh, we want to repair something or make, make it easier for the children than we thought we had it. And I think one of the ways that you can mother yourself is to mother other children. And I think that I came to realize that actually this was somehow my leitmotif, that I was really mothering myself by looking after other children. You grew up in, in Czechoslovakia. Yes. And I think you were around about 10 years old when Germany invaded. Yes, I was. And your life years changed old. forever. Yes, yes, yes. as he did for very many other, for, well, for all the mm -hmm. Jewish population of the whole of Europe, but also for non-Jews. And your father escaped to Poland then? Yes, he managed to get out just after the Germans invaded, or they didn't invade, they were given Czechoslovakia. They just marched in, yes. yes. So he left you and your mother? And, and, sister. and your older sister yes. behind. Yes. That yes. must be very difficult. Uh, I, I have a sort of blur. I can't remember in detail anymore. I mean, it must have been hell for my mother, you know, suddenly to be left with two children and no means of support. But the idea was to follow him as soon as possible. So you tried escaping Czechoslovakia by fleeing to Poland? In order to get to England to join our father. But before this could happen, war broke out on the 1st of September or 3rd, I think. And we were stuck in Krakow and we stayed there for six months. And then we illegally separately, my mother, my sister and I, all separately went back into Czechoslovakia, to Ostrava, to my hometown. And uh, because my mother had no means of support, I was sent to this Jewish, it was nominally an orphanage, although it had quite a few children like myself who weren't orphans, but whose parents, either one parent was abroad or who didn't have the means to support them. It was really a very enlightened children's home. Uh, but there were some real orphans there too, yes. I think the director of that orphanage was someone who had worked with Anna Freud in the Jackson That's nurseries. Right. Yes, yes, yes. So you were in this orphanage, um, away from your family. Yes. And that must have been a, a very difficult time for you. I was desperately unhappy there. I remember I was desperately unhappy there because I, uh, first of all, it was the first time I had to live a communal life. I was so, uh, I suppose, shocked 
by the attitude of these girls who were orphans and who had a very different attitude to authority. To authority. They, you know, they didn't care. They weren't, they didn't try to please them. At least that's how I perceived it. That there was something, they were much more uh, trying to find ways how to get around authority rather than comply. Now, I think, you know, having afterwards studied psychoanalysis, I think my compliance was, I'm sure, also based on quite ambivalent feelings towards authority. It wasn't just straightforward. But there was some kind of recognition that, uh, you know, they were the authority, however much I resented it, but uh, probably didn't dare to defy it. And then when you were age 13, the entire population of your village in Czechoslovakia yes. was tra transported to Theresienstadt. Yes. Including you and your sister and your mother. Yes. And this began another phase in your life. You were a teenager. Yeah. And your, your sister was with you. Um, did you have much contact with your... What happened with your mother at that time? Oh, we had... Uh, in Teresin, by the time we got there, uh, we were first housed in uh, barracks. I mean, Teresin was chosen, I think, because it was a military town and it had a lot of barracks, and so it accommodate, could accommodate a lot of people. And uh, we had three-storey bunks double bunks, so in one room there could be 20, 30 people. Uh, we first all lived together in these barracks. Later on, I moved to a, what was then called a children's home, where there were about 20 girls on the, in the room. My sister uh, moved with, she because she was older, she had a sort of different group of friends and they built themselves some kind of living quarters in one of the attics in the house. There were of course ordinary houses in Terezin that were also occupied by because the population, the Czech population was uh, uh, moved out of Terezin and it became a ghetto for the Jews. Uh, what was your life like there in that camp? Well, paradoxically, I, I got acquainted with literature and music in Terezin. Uh, I worked in the market gardens, which meant we went outside Terezin every morning and came back in late afternoon, I suppose, uh, growing vegetables for the Germans. Not for us, of course, but for the Germans. But because uh, a lot of artists were Jews, we had uh, uh, composers, pianists, conductors, uh, and they were actually, uh, I heard the Verdi's Requiem, I heard in Terezin, because the conductors and the singers, they formed choirs, and I heard Magic Flute performed as a, as a, just a performance without, of course, the acting. So, as I say, paradoxically, in Terezin, I came across literature and music that I didn't have access to at home. And then you were there until the age of 16? Uh, 50, yeah, just before 16, yes, mm -hmm. yes. And then your life was to change again? That's right, yes. Then I volunteered to join my mother and sister when they were sent to Auschwitz. Well, we didn't know, we did and didn't know that it was Auschwitz, but it was somewhere east. Yeah. And why did you choose to volunteer? I think I was somehow felt it was important to stay together as a family. And as I say, because 
uh, one's defense mechanisms worked so well. And again, it was something that I, I didn't know at the time, but realized retrospectively that in fact, the need to deny what was ahead was so strong in people that it was also partly the need to deny, but partly also it was beyond imagination. I mean, it was... It was truly horrifying when you got there, yeah. what you saw. Yeah. So what happened when you arrived in the camp? So you had a long journey to get well, there. Well, uh, what happened first of all was that when I went to volunteer, I, I, and the, I wasn't the only one, there were a few of us, were told that we couldn't go, but we just sort of hung around, we thought we'd wait until the train leaves. And then suddenly they had an extra carriage, so they let us go. Of course, by then my mother and sister were already sealed in an earlier carriage, so that my mother didn't know I was, I was joining them. I, of course, never saw my mother again because she was sent to the right. And when you uh, said she was sent to the right, that was, was that Dr. Mengele? When we came, yes, mm -hmm. when we got off the train, and I think it must have been purpose, on purpose, the trains always arrived in the night when it was pitch dark and there were just these glaring uh, uh, headlights, uh, electrified uh, fences and uh, soldiers with bayonets and uh, big dogs. So people were extra or disorientated because it was night time, yes. is that what yes. you mean? Yes, I yes. think it was, yes. Yes, in a way to, yeah, I, I imagine it was deliberate policy. Because wherever we arrived, we always arrived in the night, except for Theresien. Uh, yes, and you had to go through the gate where Mengele stood, and he looked at you and decided that if you looked like somebody who could work and could still be used, you would be sent to the left, and if you were too young or too old, or perhaps looked not well enough, you were sent to the right, which meant you went straight to the chambers. And my mother was sent to the right. And when I then came into this huge hall, my sister, my poor sister, nearly had a heart attack because she thought I was in Terezin, and suddenly I appeared in Auschwitz. So she, she was hoping that you were safe? She believed that I was safe because she had no idea that I had come. But I think it must have been quite a help in the end that we were together, that she wasn't on her own. So it helped her survive and, and perhaps you too? Uh, I, well, yes, but also I think we were lucky enough. First of all, we were only three days in Auschwitz, and that we were sent to a work camp, which actually wasn't the worst. It was, we were lucky enough that we were housed in what uh, I thought was an old, Factory. My sister thought it was an old school, but well, never mind whatever it was. Uh, there was a heating system in the town, you know, where the whole town had these sort of heating tubes going right through the town, so that we were always warm. It was bitter cold. We came in uh, end of October, and it was quite cold, so at least we. We were warm. And then the camps were liberated in the following year, is that right? Uh, the Americans were advancing from the West. We were evacuated, and that was, I think, in about April. April 1945. 45. 
we were evacuated in open cattle trucks this time. There were 500 women in that camp, uh, 300 Czech girls and 200 Polish girls. Uh, we were evacuated and ended up in Terezin. Back at the... Back, back where we started. And we got there, I think, at the end of April. And on the 8th of May, the Russians liberated us on the way to Prague. And it was after then that you came to helping in the orphanage of children? In this you... home, yes, 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 yes. That was, yes, that was after that, yes. And what was that like working with children? They'd grown up in... Yes, but that. they had no idea. You know, they, uh, there was a radio and... They went to look around the corner to see where the voice was coming from. I mean, they literally had not much idea about what life outside Terezin was like. Yeah. And they must have been really severely traumatized. You were 16, 17 at the time. Yes, I mean, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have known about what emotional state they were in. I mean, I was myself, I suppose, uh, in a way, cut off from my feelings. Not surprising. You know, that's one way of surviving, yeah. is to be cut off yeah. from your feelings. Yeah. So you you know from your own experience the importance of defences? Indeed, yeah. indeed, yes, yeah. yes. And then you travelled to the UK. Uh, yes. And were re reunited with your father. We were, uh, I mean, there was a... The whole world was looking for relatives via newspapers, via radio, and I, I think we found our father through a newspaper and got in touch with him. And uh, there was an opportunity to come to England and my father very much wanted me to come and I wanted to come because I didn't really feel I had a life in the Czech Republic. Well, it was Czechoslovakia then. My sister was by then already living with her future husband, and they found a flat in Prague. He went to Prague from Terezin with some Russian soldiers, and he just walked into a flat that the Germans, some German occupants had run away from, and they lived in that flat until they came to England in 68. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my sister had no desire to come to England. And how was it being reunited with your father? Uh, sadly, another trauma, because he had uh, what I think was a nervous breakdown. Once he learned that apart from my sister and myself, his entire family perished. His wife, his parents, or his sisters, he had six, well, one was in France, one in Israel, four of his sisters, their husbands and children, everybody wiped out. So that was a bit too much for him. And he never really managed to establish himself uh, in, in work. In England, so it wasn't it wasn't the welcome that I had dreamt about when I was in London, and I imagined he was a lord and would make up for all the hardships. Didn't turn out like that. So that must be very difficult for you, uh, with a father who was really struggling. Yes, it it was it was again. I somehow I managed to. I don't know, I, I found a way of coping with it by finding a school. So when you came to the UK, you established yourself in London and had to catch up on your education, even enrolling yourself into a secondary school, I believe. That's right, yes. yes. I think much to the surprise of everybody that somebody volunteered to come to school. Yeah. And after getting yourself a degree, you started your child psychotherapy training. Yes. Um, that was established by Anna Freud. Yes. How much contact did you actually have with Anna Freud during your training? 
uh, once a week, regularly, on a Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday meetings are a tradition in psychoanalytic, uh, in all psychoanalytic societies, I think started because Freud had his uh, meetings on Wednesday and I think the Institute uh, still continues having their scientific meetings on a Wednesday and Anna Freud instituted it at the clinic at the training on Wednesday afternoon uh, all the teachers and uh, interested people who were invited came to hear a presentation mostly by students or by qualified therapists or occasionally invited speaker and in fact when she started the, when we had the house and started the Wednesday meetings students were only invited if Anna Freud thought they were worthy of being invited. Not every student was invited. Later on it became compulsory, but when I was training it wasn't, it wasn't open to everybody. And it was during those meetings when, after the presentation, Anna Freud commented on the on the presentation. And she had such clinical acumen, she would hone in on what the child's problem was. However good or bad the presentation, she would put her finger on where the child's problem was and even predict what the outcome might be. But more importantly, it was the place where you watched technique being changed. Anna Freud believed in following the child, not imposing her theory on the child, but listening to the child. And as she would listen to the presentation, she would say, you know, I don't think this child can understand your interpretation of defenses. They're not there yet. You have to approach it from another angle. You have to perhaps actually help the child recognize that they have feelings, or name the feelings. And it was really an education in how technique evolved in front of our eyes. And I think this is what I, I mean, apart from the other very important aspects of the training, but this is where one tra learned from her. So your training was mostly in Freud's theories? Yes, really almost exclusively, I would say. Case studies, his theory of sexuality, his, you know, his basic uh, ego, it's super ego, all his basic analytic theory. And I must say that uh, it was such a well-planned, consistent, coherent, theoretical background that it has stood me in really in very good stead throughout my whole life. I can still somewhere kind of fish out something that I learned 60 years ago. It really was a very, very good grounding and it allowed one to develop from it. You know, you didn't have to stick rigidly to it, but you could grow from it. But you had this as a good, solid base. What inspired you to train as a child psychotherapist? There was very few around. When I came to England in '45, after I had caught up a bit with my education, I went to work in a nursery for they were called difficult children at that time. They were actually children who were not able to be returned home after evacuation for various reasons because parents weren't able to look after them. And there was a nursery was run under the auspices of the National Association for Mental Health. And the director of this home was Ruth Thomas, who was at the time in analysis with Anna Freud and training to be an analyst. And uh, she 
introduced this regime that Anna Freud had introduced in her monasteries, namely that we uh, made observations every night, we wrote up our observations of the children, of what they did and how they did it and what they said and what they felt on index cards. And Ruth Thomas came at the weekend and we had seminars with her and we went through these uh, cards and she would begin to teach us psychoanalytic concepts based on our observations. So we began to get an inkling of what psychoanalytic theory is like and also the beginnings of what transference feels like. Uh, the children were organized in groups, so each one of us had five children and we were their group mother and were the first person they related to and then they had not such co close contact with others. So it was very much based on the idea that relationships matter and the fewer, ch the fewer children have to relate to one adult the easier it is for them, particularly because they are more or less at the same age. This is where I began to get an idea about uh, psychoanalysis and a possibility of training. Yes. And you began in 1953, That's age right. 24. Yes. What was the training comprised of in those days? What, how it did they was, train you? Well, we were actually trained as analysts. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had, in fact, a much more thorough training that the analysts at the Institute. We had five times a week on a personal analysis. We had to see three children five times a week, and under five, a latency child and an adolescent. We had lectures in Freud theories, and of course, uh, well, when I started, Anna Freud hadn't developed a developmental theory yet. We used to have seminars in the lecturers' homes because the first house, I think, wasn't bought till about, well, it must have been later. I know that uh, uh, I finished my training when there was already a clinic and I managed to see some of the children in the Hampstead Clinic. But I started out as a training psychotherapist in uh, Ilford, uh, Walthamstow in Ilford. And I saw children there uh, before the clinic was actually set up. So I was actually uh, around when the clinic properly got a home. And by this time, by the time you started your training, there was already considerable rivalry and enmity between Anna Freud and Melanie Klein. Is that something you were aware of at the time? Uh, I was aware of the fact that Tavistock, which was based on Melanie Klein's teachings, although she herself wasn't involved with the training, Anna Freud, there was, you know, a big gulf between us and their teaching and our teaching. In fact, it was I suppose I didn't know directly about the controversial discussions. I learned about this much later, but we had one Hungarian uh, uh, seminar leader lecturer, Dr. Barbara Lantos, who was very instrumental in the controversial discussions and very much championed Anna Freud. And I must say, she literally, dripped poison about Melanie. She really hated her and she actually, told, you know, she was, when she was teaching us, she couldn't stop herself from kind of bad-mouthing Melanie. So in some ways I was a bit infected by my view of Melanie from, uh, not from uh, Barbara Lantos, but the Association of Child Psychotherapists was also for, founded, and actually Ruth Thomas was very instrumental in this. And she'd been in the nursery that you trained no, at, that no, you worked she, at. Yeah, that's right, yes, mm -hmm. that nursery, yes. But what 
the association of child psychotherapists was determined to do was not to replicate the uh, hostility and rivalry in the institute. So we were very careful not to, uh, at least officially, have these disagreements. Uh, very interestingly, what happened was we set up uh, study weekends where we had, at that time there were four training schools. There was Hampstead, Tavistock, the Löwenfeld Center, which wasn't really analytic, but sort of became part of the association, and the Jungian training. And speakers from each of the schools, we took a topic and we, I can't remember what the first topic was, I think short-term psychotherapy, once weekly psychotherapy. And from each school, uh, from each of the trainings, somebody presented a paper. And what we discovered was that we used the same concept, but had a completely different meaning. So we took concepts like defense, internalized objects, whatever. We took a concept and again presented it from all these different points of view and we agreed that we would agree to differ. Privately, you know, the Tavi thought, well, the, those Anna Freud people, they don't know what they're talking about and we had similar views on them. But that was private, publicly, and really it, it helped that people weren't so, uh, you know, they weren't enemies. <laughs> Uh, so it helped to create a different atmosphere in the, uh, in the ACP. So it's been more than 60 years since you qualified as a child psychotherapist. How much has child psychotherapy, psychoanalytic child psychotherapy, changed during that time? The kind of disturbances that our trainees have to cope with. I mean, never in a hundred years would I have been given a child who is uh, impulse-driven, has no visible <laughs> internal conflict, given as a training case at the Anafra. They wouldn't have even passed the threshold there. Uh, today, our trainees have to deal with the most complex uh, disturbances and they have to find a way of working with these children. And so they do need different techniques, is that what you're they saying? They need different techniques, they need, yes, they need. Uh, Anne Harry was very much somebody who developed, again, something that Anna Freud started, but then distanced herself from it because she felt it wasn't pure analysis. What, what became known as developmental therapy, that is children who really haven't got a well-functioning ego, you know, who don't know that they have, you know, they're angry, but they don't know that they can call it, I'm angry, they punch. So they haven't got a, you know, they haven't developed a capacity to symbolize in order to be able to control their impulses better. So this is very much more what, uh, child therapists have to face today and of course children who are looked after who've had severe losses you know so much also therapists have to deal with the loss of the uh, biological mother uh, five foster homes before they are six very very different the social fabric has changed and has produced different disturbances. Are you seeing that children are more emotionally disturbed these days than, than when you started training, even in the post-war era when there was an awful lot of trauma? Yes. So after you qualified in 1957, aged mm -hmm. 24, Four. you spent some years working in what were then called child guidance clinics. Yes. 
And then in 1962, you went to work at somewhere called the Castle Hospital, mm -hmm. where you developed the Department of Child Psychotherapy there. In fact, you were the very first child psychotherapist to be employed there. Yes. Tell me about the Castle Hospital and, and what they did there. Tom Main was uh, appointed as medical director in '48. He uh, took it into the health service and started what was essentially a therapeutic community with psychoanalytic treatment. Psychoanalytically informed therapeutic community. By the time you came to work there, um, there, there were women and, and their children being treated there. Um, but you transformed the mother and baby unit into a family unit. Fathers were never admitted as patients, but they could visit. But uh, we began to kind of look at the family as a unit and found that often fathers uh, may have been the disturbed patient. And we began to look at families to see what family functioning, how it worked and didn't work. And so gradually after we started having children referred with mothers, uh, we began to admit fathers also as patients to have either individual therapy or being seen together. And I think this was actually Fayek Nakla, the, one of my colleagues, who was very interested in doing this. Can you... Tell me about the daily life in, in the clinic there. So the, the, the people you were treating were living there. Seeing children as outpatients and seeing children as inpatients was very different because you had so much more information about the children from all kinds of sources, the nurses, the parents, the reports. So it wasn't pure psychotherapy as it was done in an outpatient, but you had to take into account all this other information that you had and find a way of treating the children, but also involving, for instance, the nurses in helping them to think about the children, not just as mother's appendages, but as children in their own right, so, so do you think it would be a good idea if these sort of inpatient family units were created again for families who are struggling? I think uh, it would certainly be also uh, financially cheaper for the, for the health service because if, you, if a family can't function as a family, the child may end up in an institution which is much more expensive to run, to, to maintain a child in a boarding school or in a school for delinquents or whatever. So economically it would make sense, but uh, you would have to have enlightened politicians who would do it, and I don't think we have them. So... You retired quite early, I think age 55, yes. from the Castle Hospital. And you've been involved in the Association of Child Psychotherapists um, from the 1950s onwards on the executive yes. committee, I believe. And you actually then became chair of the training council of the ACP. Yes. And, and then in the early 90s, you were instrumental in setting up the child psychotherapy section of the European Federation of Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy. And you became its first secretary. Yes. And, and you've been very active teaching and developing child development and, and child psychotherapy in Eastern and Central European countries ever since. What motivated you to get involved? Because I'm really a European. <laughs> I am not a native Brit. And although I've lived here all these years, uh, I still have somewhere... And I still feel European. And for me, Brexit is a tragedy. 
but that's another story. Uh, so I was interested in, in helping to set up something that would bring together the Europeans. How I got involved with the Czech training, that was again a different story. One of the, before the, before the Iron Curtain came down, there was a Hungarian analyst who had an organization called East-West Imago. And she used to invite analysts from behind the Iron Curtain who were somehow managing to work as analysts. And one day, one of the Czech analysts was invited to talk. So I came and listened to him. I thought, well, he's Czech. I'll see what's happening in Czechoslovakia. And afterwards, I went up to him and introduced myself. And one thing led to another. And when he heard that I was a child therapist, the Czechoslovakia had a child analyst before the war. She emigrated to Israel. Czechoslovakia had actually a very thriving analytic community before the war. Then Hitler, well, many of them were Jews who emigrated to America or didn't. Uh, first Hitler, you know, the Nazis forbade it, then the communists forbade it, but somewhere underground it still kind of existed. And when he heard that I was a child tra therapist, he had the idea that I should come and help them set up a training for child therapists. So that's how that came about. So what has been the impact of this toing and froing from here to Eastern and Central, Central Europe? We are very much kind of revered people there because we actually did start something that has flourished and is now a self-sufficient training. There was a lull after the first group train. But now it's a very much a thriving undertaking and a lot of training. They have a lot of trainees, and uh, I am the grandmother of the training. <laughs> and you're still involved? Well, I'm still involved to the extent that they have biannual conferences, mm -hmm. and somehow I always have to produce something for the conference. And then you have become more involved um, since your retirement in the uh, British Association of Psychotherapists, which became the British Psychotherapy Foundation. Yes. And you've described that as your home. I describe it as my professional mm. home, yes. Mm. yes. Why is that? Well, I was never offered a job at the mm. Hampstead Clinic mm. after I qualified, and then I kind of went off and did my thing at the castle. By the time I retired, I was asked to teach uh, on the training and then I got more involved and joined the training committee and it was a very congenial place and I kind of adopted it and they adopted me, so it was a successful mutual adoption. So you've seen many generations of child psychotherapists I come have, through and being yes. involved in their training, yes. both here and in Europe. Yes. What would you What would you say to child psychotherapists just starting out? What's the most important thing for them? Listen to the child. Don't go in with preconceived ideas, but just listen to the child. Make you know you have to establish a relationship with the child before they will trust you to, with their problems. And, uh, uh, you know, every trainee considers making the right interpretation mm. the most important thing. And it's somehow helping them to let go of this idea and maybe just being with a child is more important than what you say to the child. It's how you are with the child that is more important than what you say to the child. But you follow the child, you don't dictate to the child. And looking back on your career, 
What are you most satisfied about your contribution to the lives of children that you've worked with? It's setting up the training in the Czech Republic. That I feel is my important contribution. Mm -hmm. I suppose, uh, and now that you, uh, uh, I used to be the first point of contact when people were ringing up the BAP and said, uh, can, is there a child training? And I was always the first point of contact. And I enjoyed me, you know, I enjoyed listening to why people wanted to train and helping them to uh, get going. And so often I'm very touched when they say, well, Lydia was the first person I talked to and she actually got me interested in starting to train. So that feels very kind of satisfying, yeah. I think that's yeah. a good note to end on. Thank you for your contribution to child psychotherapy, Lydia. It's appreciated by us all. And thank you for spending the time with me talking about your career. You're welcome.